Hi, everybody. Welcome to, I guess this is what, week five or week six? Um, I'm not completely sure. Let's uh, take a look here at uh, what was going on on here. This looks like this is week five. Uh, so are there any questions before we start up? I will assume that that is a no. And let's go ahead and get started. So uh, I'm going to start working from where we left off with the movies example. And we're going to do a few little improvements here to, uh, to demonstrate uh, a little bit stronger data flow. Um, not at the moment. Can you hear me right now? Can you hear me now? I am saying. Yes, I can hear you now. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what was going on. Uh, something with Zoom or something with uh, my microphone, but I think it's uh, looks like I'm okay now. Okay, so oh, I'm on mobile. I had to specifically tell that I wanted to hear you. Ah, okay. Yeah, well, that's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you for hearing me. So I'm um, going to start with uh, where we uh, left off before. This isn't going to work into any more assignments, uh, but there's a little bit more separation and immutability that I want to talk about that you may want to consider in your applications. Um, there's always this trade-off between doing things right in or doing things a good way inside of a loose structure versus tightening the structure up a little bit so you can't do things a bad way. And uh, that that's always going to you know cause a little bit of you know back and forth you know should I shouldn't I because sometimes it's a little bit more work to make it uh, a little bit uh, more bulletproof. So what I would like to do is try to break things up a little bit more in this application so that the data part is a little more isolated and you can't directly use the entities. Right now, if we take a look at our movie view model, we can see that. When we have rating or movie or actor coming through, these are rating with movies. And when we have the lists, these ratings flow, this is a list of rating, a list of movie, a list of actors. Those are actually the entities defined down in the database layer. And the big problem there is that those entities are mutable. And if we take a look at our data, we have movie here we'll see that this movie is mutable. He has a VAR, a VAR for uh, title, description, and rating ID and for ID. And that would allow the user interface to change those values. And the user interface wouldn't know they've changed because these are not being represented as stable or immutable objects that Compose understands. So it wouldn't know when to update things. Uh, and that could cause you some grief. Now, the way we've written things so far, we're not doing that. You know, we don't have it, so I'm coming in and directly changing the title or description of a movie. I'm making a copy of it, which then, and then saving it in the database, which triggers some more updates. Uh, having it a little bit more immutable would set it up so that the user interface can't accidentally modify those and think that it's going to trigger some changes. Uh, and that's especially important when you get multiple people working on a project who may not understand fully how the data flow is actually working in the application. Uh, you know, because you're going to have some people who are more senior than others or some people who are more familiar with the project than others. So what I'd like to try to do is break this out a little bit. I'd like to move the data parts into its own module and make sure that what you get out of there is not going to be visible to the user interface. But it can be visible to a mid-layer, which is where the repository comes in. And the repository at that layer, we can put in some data transfer objects to make this stuff truly immutable. So to do this, what I want to do is come up to the movies level at the top. I'm going to create a new module. And this particular module doesn't need any um, uh, Android user interface on it, but it does need some uh, context and things like that for the database to be able to be created. So we're still going to call it an Android library as opposed to an Android application. And this one I'm going to call just data. And we'll make it in Kotlin and say finish. We'll let that sync. And what that does in our build, if we take a look up at the top level, we have our 
settings.gradle, who includes the modules that we want to build as part of the, the build that we're doing here. So you'll see that it includes app, that's what we had before, but now it includes this new library called data. We're going to have to set up data so he has all the same dependencies we needed for room. So I'm going to go back to the app module and in his build.gradle, I'm going to copy out the stuff that we pulled in here. Now we're not going to use, use uh, the uh, material stuff, we just need the room stuff. So I'm going to copy that and then go to the data module and go to his build.gradle and paste it in. Now we're also going to need to change that guy. And we're not going to need uh, Android X. I don't think we're going to need these guys. So let me just comment them out for right now. Because we're just working At with At least data. for me, I don't have any video. Are, are oh, you hey, you know what? I didn't share the screen. Let me share the screen. Now it's actually going to be in the Camtasia video, but yeah, thank you for mentioning that because sharing the screen might actually help. There, you should see it now. Is that good? Yes, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. And let me get this back over here. Okay. Yeah, hey, that would make much more sense. Um, at least Camtasia is recording that. So when you look at the video later on, you can see what I was talking about. Um, so what I had done, just to, to re-explain it really briefly, is I right-clicked on the project. I said, new module. I chose Android library and made this be data and then hit finish. So that created a brand new module that if I look at the top level, my settings.gradle file is actually including both of these guys. So we have the app and we have the data module. Those are the ones that are gonna be built. So the next thing that I did was I came in to my app module and copied the room dependencies and I pasted them in to the, uh, the, the build.gradle for the data layer. So that way I can use room for this guy. Uh, and I'm also gonna have to pull in up here at the top, the uh, specification for using KSP, the Kotlin symbol processor. So back from my main app guy here, come back to data and I'll paste him in. And I'm gonna do a sync. Now, right now, nothing's depending on this data module, but eventually we're gonna set it up so that whoever needs data is gonna use this. <clears throat> so at this layer, I'm going to take all the stuff that was in this data directory and I'm going to copy that over. So let's see what he's got. Underneath data, we've got source, main, Java, com, Java, do data. And I'm just going to take these guys and paste them down there. And we'll when I did that paste, we'll notice that it actually changed the uh, package name for me. And I really should change that package name. Let me. Um, should be like com Java dude movies three data. Uh, let's actually just do this. I'm going to delete those again for a second. And right now, if I try to add a package here, it's going to put it after data. So I'm going to go up to the little gear guy and I'm going to get rid of this compact middle packages. And now we'll see that it actually spells out the directory structure main Java com Java dude data. So now what I can do at the Java dude level is say new package and I'll say movies three. And then I'm going to just move that data directory inside movies three. Um, okay. Yeah. So that ended up in the Android manifest here. For this guy, I have it as com Java do data. I want to change that there as well. That should make that happy. And let me just double check the build.gradle. He doesn't have any references for that. That looks good. Okay, let me close things down a little bit. I'm now going to take these data guys and I'm just going to actually move them. I'm doing control X on those. And whoops, let me try this. It looks like that got canceled. I'm gonna go ahead and paste in the new stuff. And now it has the right package name. I'm gonna get rid of this old data guy, that's fine. And so now we have all these room entities defined inside of 
this data module. And up here, we no longer have anything in data. So I'm gonna delete him. And let's take a look at how things look here. You'll notice if I open up the view model, I'm starting to get some errors here because I no longer have these classes inside of, uh, they're, they're not accessible from here. So that's fine, so far so good. And what just happened here? Somebody just said having trouble with something. Oh, and that was just a note from the university. Okay, so what we wanna do is set it up so that these guys are gonna compile fine just by themselves. And I wanna put one more layer in that I'm gonna call the repository layer. And the repository layer is gonna be the only thing that reads the data layer, but the repository layer is going to expose our data transfer objects. So let's come up here and say new module, and it's gonna be an Android library. And I'm gonna call it repo. And that will, down in my settings.gradle, add in that repo include. And if we take a look inside of here, let's take a look at his manifest. And I'm just going to rename this to be movies3.repo. And then for the actual path here, I'm going to do the same kind of thing, adding in movies3. And then I'm going to say new package underneath there, uh, repo. And we can just get rid of this guy. And I got rid of him as well. Yep, that's good. So now we want to take the repo stuff. So this movie database repository and movie repo and move those. So I'm going to hit a control X on those and move them into repo down here. And so now they're in there. Now there's gonna be some things in here that we need to reference. We're gonna to need to be able to reference all these things from the movie's data. And we're going to have to bring in the, the uh, coroutines library. So if I come back to our app, there's our app, take a look at him. And who's unhappy about flow? Let's update him. He's got the, all oh, that looks okay. So why is he unhappy about? Kotlinx coroutines flow. Some, now what's happening here? I need the dependency for coroutines. I'm assuming at the app level here, one of these guys pulled that in and I'm pretty sure that it was this guy right here, the room KTX one. So this room guy has a dependency on the coroutines uh, libraries, which is why it's automatically being pulled in as a, as a transitive dependency. But now that I've separated that out, so I'm not using room at the repo level, it can't see that. So I need to explicitly bring in that coroutine support. So if I come back over to this guy here, I'm just going to go to a browser. I'm going to say Kotlin coroutines dependency. And this will happen once in a while with uh, transitive dependencies. It, uh, it can be a little fun to deal with. Uh, I'm going to come into this Kotlin coroutines on Android. It tells me which dependency information to use. So I can just go ahead and pull him in. I'm going to go to the Groovy implementation. Copy that. And this is under repo, so I'm going to paste him in there. I'm going to hit Alt Enter to change it to whatever the most recent version is. And now if I sync, at least the, the flow should be happy in that repository. There, now flow is happy. Now we'll notice that we have all these other guys here that are getting pulled from the data layer. So we need to have the repository layer depend on the data layer. So in the repository layers build.gradle, I'm going to add in implementation project colon data, just like that. And this will match 
the reference inside settings.gradle. So see here, this says, I'm going to look for a sub project called data, which is in this directory underneath the main directory. I can now reference that as colon data in a project reference. And there's the repo one, just like that. And so now if I sync, we should see it having access to the actual data there. So we'll go to movie database repository and boom, everything's happy. Now we'll notice that before when I copied this over, it actually had fully qualified all these guys, which is pretty gross. And let's see if we get lucky with a control shift O for organize imports. Well, this guy, we're gonna have to um, do something about the database. We'll come back to that in a second. <clears throat> but unfortunately, we've got all these explicit references. So I'm just going to go with uh, Control F to bring this dialog up. And let's actually just replace those with nothing. Boom. And then I should be able to just Control Space after each of these to pull them in. That's a little better so far. And see, we're left. So up here, now we have to deal with somehow getting the database. Uh, so this, if we want to restrict what we're looking at as far as the, the room details and not propagate that up, we're going to need to move this to a lower level. So we're going to need to have something at the data level that allows us to create that database. So I'm going to take this code here. I'm going to cut it. And I'm going to come back to the data level. And I'm going to add in a database builder file. And I'm going to have a fun create ah, database equals that guy. And then down at the data level, I can use room. Now he does need a con an application context here. So I'm going to pass that in. So that the application context can be used to locate the database and figure out where to write the database files to inside Android. Once I have that, I should now be able to call create database from here. And so I can say private db equals private val db might help. Create database, passing in the application. Boom, just like that. And what is the unhappy about here? Canon access room database, which is a super type of him. Mm. That's interesting that that's a problem. I'm not quite sure why it needs to have room database. So DB comes back as a movie database. Why does he need the super type there? Well, let's take a look at this as well. This whole thing just uses the DAO. So if instead of looking at the database as a whole here, I just get the DAO instead of, instead of going just to create the database, I can say create DAO, something like that. And then just say dot DAO on the end of that. And let's see if that makes that a little happier. I think there's something in the generated code that was requiring it to actually have the, oops, let's make that be DAO. And then let's change all of these to just DAO. Now we're a little happier there. I like it when we can keep things abstract and you don't have to know about how the database is done behind the scenes. We can kind of hide that. So here we're just going to create that DAO, which is going to create the database instance and then get us our DAO. And then we can use the DAO for all of this work inside here. Um, so that's pretty nice. Let's take a look in our repo and see if 
anything up here needs to change. Um, so all of these guys, the data that's coming through, we're going to change to reference the uh, um, to to create some DTOs. So we need a, a data transfer object for each one of these that we can create. So let's add those in here. So we need actor, movie, role, et cetera. I'm just going to copy all of those from data into here, and then we're going to change them. So the actor is instead of these being an entity, he's going to be an actor DTO for data transfer object. And he's going to have a val for each of these, but not have a default value on it. And then actor with roles, he's going to have an actor, which is an actor DTO. And then roles, which is going to be for a movie DTO, which we're going to need to define and come back here. Our movie, similar type of thing. Can have a movie DTO. And he's going to be, whoops. And then get rid of that. And movie with roles DTO. It's going to have a movie DTO inside of him. And then roles will be actor DTO. And we don't need the DAO at this level, so I'm going to delete that. Don't need the database at this level. Rating, we're going to need to fix up. He's going to be a rating DTO. And then this guy. Rating DTO, up, 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 and movie DTO for that guy. And then roll, similar type of thing. Get rid of all the database stuff. Roll DTO. And those have to be vals. And we'll get rid of all that down there as well. I don't think we are using that directly here. Um, yeah, I don't think we need to have that because that's just used as a join table. So I'm going to delete that. OK, and let's take a little closer look at some of these. So like actor DTO here, uh, it would be nice to be able to specify that this thing is immutable. Uh, but then I'm going to need to pull in some of the uh, Jetpack Compose support in order to do that. So let's take a look at our app. Up at our app level, we have build.gradle. We're going to need to pull in. Let's see, can I pull in just compose runtime? Let me take a look here. And does he I'm just trying to remember where uh, immutable and stable are done. They're probably inside compose runtime. Um, but he's not a that's right, he's not a separate dependency right now. So we'll have to actually pull the top level one in. So let's pull him in. I think he's gonna be the right guy. Come back to the repo layer. And let's do a sync on him. And then inside of here, let's see if we can do at immutable. There we go. And then I can go to my movie and do the same thing. And down here as well. And then where we have rating, the same thing. OK, so that should set it up so that uh, Compose can know something's immutable there. 
And I think everything looks good at this layer. So now we need to set up the translation between the DTOs and the, the entities. So for actor, I'm going to define a nice little fun actor dot to DTO function here to just say actor DTO, passing in ID equals ID and name equals name. So that'll create our DTO. And then I can go the other way as well, actor DTO to entity. Oh, just actor and have the same kind of thing. So these give us a couple little extension functions that are gonna make it easy to translate from one to the next. And we're gonna do the same kind of thing with movie. Fun movie to DTO. ID equals ID, title equals title, description equals description, and rating ID equals rating ID. And then we can do the same kind of thing the other direction. And then we'll do the same kind of thing for rating. And we'll go the other way as well. Like that. Now you can start to see how this extra separation is costing us a decent bit of code here. Um, we're having some, what feels like redundancy. I mean, the main difference here is that we're changing the exposure level of these, so you can't modify them. And um, that's something that, uh, at some point, I'd like to play around with some annotation processing to see if there's a way I could just generate these guys because generally these DTOs are gonna have the same data, just everything's gonna be immutable. So I think we should be able to generate these from the actual entities themselves, assuming that you want the data that's the entities under the covers. Um, it gets a little more complex when you have re uh, references to other DTOs, uh, but I think there's something here that could be done pretty easily with an annotation processor or a symbol processor in Kotlin. So this gives me this data layer that has all of this wonderful stuff in it. These guys are, we're gonna have to do the same kind of translation because we're gonna be able to get these, uh, well, actually are they immutable or not? Let's come and take a look at them real quick. So in the original guys underneath data, actor with roles, he's a Val, but he's referencing an actor instead of an actor DTO and referencing a movie instead of a movie DTO. So yeah, we're gonna have to modify those. So we'll come back over here. We're gonna do the same kind of thing with actor with roles. These are gonna be slightly more complex. So we're gonna have a fun actor with roles. Not this one though, this one's gonna be the DTO. To DTO. And this one's gonna to have to do something kind of like actor with roles DTO, passing in actor equals actor to DTO. So we're going to translate him. And then the list is going to have to be a mapping. So we're going to say the roles equals, take the roles. We're going to use the map operator to translate each thing that's inside of it. So we're going to say it that to DTO to transfer those to data to uh, um, data transfer objects. But there's one other little issue here. Notice that we're using list. We're not using that immutable list guy. And we'd like to use that immutable list guy. So I'm gonna bring the immutable list guy down. He was in common. And I don't think we need immutable set at that level. So I'm just gonna go ahead and pull those and come down to repo and create a new file here. I'm just gonna call it common, I'll just call it immutable list. He's gonna be a file, paste him in there. 
And now we can reference him. So an actor with roles, instead of this being a list, he's going to be an immutable list, which means now down here, we have to wrap it. Just like that. So roles is going to be an immutable list, wrapping the roles, mapping the roles into DTOs. So now when we create this guy, he should be immutable all the way down, which is really what we want here. We want to make sure that nobody can mess with the data that's coming through here. Um, and we don't need to go the reverse direction with this because we're never inserting one of these in the database. There isn't really an entity that we insert with. So that's all we need to do with this guy. And we're going to need to do a similar thing from the movie angle. And we have our movie with roles DTO. Actually, this one should just be movie with roles. And then this guy, what did I do? There we go. And we're going to say movie equals make the movie immutable. And then roles is going to be that list like there. Now notice in this case, roles is pointing to actors. So we're actually calling the actor to DTO to create that. And I'm going to tab these in explicitly. For some reason, uh, the formatting doesn't automatically indent these and I prefer the indentation there. So now that guy should give us a DTO there. And let's take a look at rating. I think we have ratings with movies, the same kind of thing, yeah. So we're going to have rating with movies. Actually, let me read. Yeah, he already is renamed. So rating with movies to DTO is going to be rating with movies DTO. Or we're going to go rating, convert him, and movies. We'll convert them. And so now that should allow us to have all the support we need to be able to convert these into to things that aren't entities. So outside of the repository, we shouldn't ever see any room stuff. And that means that we won't have that uh, issue of potentially accidentally changing data. So back to our movie repository. So this guy, let me first of all, get rid of all these. There we go. And we want to change these so that the only thing we expose are DTOs. And ba -doom, ba -doom, ba -doom, ba -doom, ba -doom. And the only thing we take in are the DTOs. Just kind of like that. So now our movie repository definition looks a lot better. The actual implementation is a little bit more complex. So we'll come in here and let's see. So these ones here, when we're actually going and getting these ratings flows, this flow, if I just control click on or control float on him, we'll see that it's a flow of list of ratings. So it's returning us a list of the entities from the database. So I need to modify those. I'm going to need to take that DAO ratings flow and I'm going to need to create a brand new flow that actually maps the data. So I could say dot map. And what I'm getting out of there is I have a list of ratings coming in. I need to convert it into an immutable list of rating DTOs. So this is going to need to be a convert the entire list into an immutable list. And then we're going to take all those items and convert each of them. So let's create this one. Say this one is ratings. Give it a name. And inside here, I'm going to say ratings.map it dot to DTO. Boom. And so now, anytime a new item gets emitted to this flow, that new item gets mapped. And each of those items is a full list of things. So we're going to take that list of ratings. We're going to take each rating and convert it into a DTO. And that returns us a list of DTOs. And then we wrap it in this immutable list so that we have that support 
from Jetpack Compose to know that it, the list is immutable. We're going to do the same exact thing with these other guys. And whoops. And so this one's actually going to be movies. But the logic looks exactly the same. And we'll do the same thing here. And this is going to be actors. Just like that. Now, again, we're making this more complex, but if you're dealing with a big application with lots of people working on it at the same time, chances are your data scheme is going to be much bigger than this. Um, but also, there's going to be more people hitting it, and the more you can help enforce this so that people can't do the wrong thing. Uh, you know, you don't have the opportunity to do that too often. This gives you that opportunity. So let's take a look at each of these other guys. We need to change the types to DTO on the parameters to start with. And that all looks good. So now the signatures look OK there. Um, but what's coming back here is going to be DTOs as well. And I think that's the first part. So now we have to fix what's going on with this gating rating with movies. So when we expand, we need to translate whatever we get here into a DTO, which we created a little function to do. Boom. And now those are all happy. For updating, we're coming in with a DTO, and we need to be able to update it inside of the, uh, the database. So this one we're going to have to convert from the DTO back to the entity, just like that. And what happened here? Did I mess this guy up? He's coming back with a rating. Oh, that's interesting. Um, just to see what's going on a little bit more visibly with the compiler here, I'm going to say val x equals rating dot to entity just so I can see what the type of X is. So it's a rating. Is there an issue with my, where rating is defined? So I'm gonna to try to find where rating is defined and make sure I don't have it defined twice. I get the feeling it's defined twice. Um, I'm gonna hit shift twice. That brings up my find anywhere. And I'm gonna start typing rating. And let's see we have it defined in Movies 3 repo. And we have it defined in Movies 3 data. So I think what happened is that I forgot to rename something somewhere. And let's see. No, I'm not seeing. That's, a tr that's the function there, huh? So let's come back here and see. Oh, now he seems to be happy. Um, it may have been just cleaning up an import. And I keep hitting Control-Shift-O to clean up imports. That can help out. So he seems like he's OK now. Or it could just been the analysis was slow catching up. So we don't need that. That looks like he's OK now. And let's see what else we got here. So that's our movie database repository. I believe we should be really should be ready to actually start using this now. So we're going to set it up so that the repo uses data, and he's the only one directly using data, and he's specifying data as an implementation dependency. Now, there's two types of dependencies you can use in Gradle here. You can say an implementation dependency, or you can say an API dependency. And if it's an API dependency, I would be pulling in everything that's public in here and making it part of my API so that if anybody else pulls in this module, they would see the data guy. But because I'm just saying it's an implementation dependency, it hides all of these details behind the scenes. So anybody who uses repo wouldn't see the stuff defined in data. 
So we're going to come up to the app level and have him do implementation project colon repo. So we're just bringing in that repository layer there. And I'm going to sync that. Looks like we have a couple updates here. Must have just come out. Uh, actually, do I want to? Yeah, actually, I want to have that one. Let me try syncing again. Make sure that's okay. So he looks good. So now let's take a look at the code at the at the app level now. First of all, our view model. Now our view model needs to get a hold of that repository. And because that repository is defined in something that I'm referencing, I can reference him directly. But I don't want all those explicit guys. When you move things around, the refactoring does this. It changes, it fully expands things at times. And sometimes it's really not what you want. So this should let me now import both of those and boom, we now have our movie repository. Now these other guys here like ratings with movies, these things here, we need to change these to be the DTOs. So these ones are gonna be DTO, which is defined in the repository layer. So I have access to it. And there are those. And let's see, immutable list we need to pull in from the repo layer because that's where he's defined. And let's go to the next guys down here. These are all gonna be DTO things. So we'll say DTO, 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 blah, blah, blah. And then these immutable lists, I have to pull him in. And let's pull in movie DTO. Let's pull in rating DTO and actor DTO. And now we're cooking. So there, now we have a nice clean uh, view model here. So the view model knows nothing about our room layer at all. He's now just using these immutable objects that we can pass into Jetpack Compose. So now if we take a look at the stuff that uses this, let's look at main activity real quick, see if there's anything in there we need to fix up. So empty immutable list we need to pull in from the repo layer. And I think we need to fix the screens first because this is gonna reference the screens. So let's look at common. I don't think anything in common is gonna be a problem. Nope. Let's go to screens and take a look at these guys and fix them up. Actor screen. So these are gonna be DTO situations here. Whoops. Oh, I wanna get rid of those. And now I can import him. And this is going to be a Ah. And bring an empty immutable list. Um, we might need to come back to fix that guy up. Let's go to our, I'll just go down the line on these and we'll fix these up. We may have to do a second pass to fix, to finish cleaning things up. And if we had planned for this up front, it wouldn't be quite as much work that we're doing right now. And then list scaffold. And list scaffold was a pretty easy one to fix up. It's just a matter of importing that immutable list. Movie edit screen. Paste in the DTOs, import them, and then empty immutable list. And we'll come back to him. Movie scaffold. Bring in immutable list. That's about all for him. 
movie screen. Replace all of those. Put in the DTOs for these guys. And that should be it for him. Movies screen. He's looking good. Rating screen. And ratings screen. He's good. And then let's just come back to like movie edit screen, who looks like he's now happy. Because once we fixed the movie scaffold, he was he's happy now. He can resolve his type. Now let's look at actor screen. He looks like he's good. Just need to fix up the imports. And let's just have another spin through these real quickly. And they all look clean. Yay. Now that we've got those, main activity should be a little easier to deal with. A lot easier to deal with. Poof, he's now working. And I believe that's everything. So let's give this a try and see if we get lucky and this actually works. I'm going to go ahead and run. And I think I still got to find some directory that the virus scanner is looking at. Okay, so what's happening here? So database builder has an unresolved reference to room. And where is he defined? I'm going to use this little target guy here to say where he's defined. He's underneath the repo level, which does not have room uh, access. Um, so did I put that in the wrong spot? Yeah, I, I meant to put that in the data level. Oh, I did. Why are there two of them? So this is the data level, but it also exists here. Let me go ahead and just delete this one that's inside repo. That shouldn't have been there. And let's try that again. Do, 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 do. And there we go, I'm gonna reset my database. Now I have my movies. Let's look at the transporter, Jason Statham. Oh, this is that one that we, we messed around with just to show the scrolling. Ratings, PG-13, that all looks good. Jumanji, let's try editing Jumanji. Let's just call it Jumanji instead of Jumanji, welcome to the jungle. And hit my back button here. And that looks good. Oh, this one didn't update. So uh, yeah, this one is, that one's inside of this object that has the, the nested data. Huh, I'll have to think about that. There's, we don't wanna necessarily make it so that we have to constantly update this, but that's actually wrong. So I'll think about it, uh, see if I can come up with some good ways to, to handle that. We don't want to go and explicitly say, find places that reference this and update them all explicitly. Um, but we do have quite a few things here that are going to the database and we're getting them sequentially as opposed to using a flow. So this is one of those things that probably could uh, benefit from using a flow. Let's take a quick peek here. In our DAO, when we're doing that expand, 
Let's move him out of the way so I can actually see what I'm doing. Um, that's where it's, we're calling these get ratings with movies. And the problem here is we're actually getting this sequentially. If we set this up to, to use a flow, where is he being called? He's called from expand in the repository. And then from the view model, where's the view model? There he's up there. So we're actually doing these explicitly. Kind of wondering why I did it this way. I guess I was demonstrating how you could do things in line. Um, but what we really want to do is set it up so that this rating guy is just pulled from the database. I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll tinker around a little bit. There's, um, what we need to do is, is set it up so that this rating would be a flow and set it up so that that flow can change based on the ID. So really what we'd have here is we would have a either a state or a flow that we emit the movie ID to or the rating ID or the actor ID. And then that would be used to drive another one. So I'm going to look up uh, the way to do that. I don't do that one too often, but it, it makes it a little bit more complex, but then it's automatic and it'll show up. So I will uh, check into that either on the break or after class and fix that up. And then we should have a very nice automated system on that. <clears throat> okay, are there any questions on what we've done so far? So that's the main thing. Let's see, so it's 524. I'm just trying to think time-wise, if I have time to just go ahead and talk through that right now. Um, I think this could work. Let me, uh, let's try something. Let's say that we want to have a spot where we can plug in the rating that we want to look up. So we could do something kind of like uh, var rating. Well, these are, so these are the DTOs. Um, let's go with rating ID by mutable state of. Uh, we'll make it a string, make it nullable, and there's nothing there to start with. So we're going to use him to start with, and he's going to be our state that we want to listen to to see if there's a change and then trigger a database change. Uh, now, to do that, we're going to need to convert this state into a flow. This is the thing I'm, I'm not quite sure I'm remembering how to do right. But let's do this. Let's say var rating, actually, this would be a val. Rating with movies flow. And he is going to be a take my rating ID and I'm actually going to have to look this up because I, I can't remember the syntax. The idea here is I want to say take this, this uh, state, convert it into a flow that I can use to drive the database lookup. So I'm going to look up that syntax at the break and we will make that work. So any other questions? So I'm going to put this one aside for the moment. I mean, it looks like most of it's working. You can kind of see how the structure worked on here. If we can get this piece working, that's going to simplify quite a few things. Um, and let's take a look at some layouts. Come in here, I'm going to say layouts. We'll let that sync itself. Okay, so what we're talking about here is how we want to organize our data on the screen. And we've seen a couple pretty simple layouts. We've seen columns and seen rows. We haven't really done much else other than that. And there's some real power here using Jetpack Compose to be able to organize your user interface. And I'm going to get rid of the little dummy stuff down here. And what I'd like to do is start off by, let's, let's say we want to display a little form on the screen for the user to edit. And we saw the one approach, which is just straight a, a, a column of label field, label field, label field, label field. And you know that's fairly useful. Um, 
let me pull in, uh, let's see, so we have label, I'll pull him over. And then let's take a look at a little edit text here. Copy him. And I'm gonna leave that commented out. Don't worry about the comments in there for the moment. I'm just gonna leave it commented out for now. That'll come in a little handy a little bit later. Um, but let's take a look at the, the first layout that we were talking about here. Um, and what I'd like to do is drive this, do I wanna drive it by data? Do I wanna just do it explicitly? Let's just do it explicitly for right now. Um, and then we could actually do data-driven layouts a little bit later. Uh, so to start with, let's just use a, use a column here. So I'm gonna say, give me a composable function and we'll say column form. And this guy is just gonna say, I have a column. And then inside there, I have a label for something like name. And let's do another one for age and then street, city, whoops, and zip perhaps. So we're gonna have several fields on the screen and I wanna stack them. So I'm gonna have that and I'm gonna have an edit field. And this edit field's a little different than what we did before. This one's not gonna have the box around it that has the text. This edit, we're just gonna outline it without having that label. So I don't use the label syntax on this. So it's still gonna give us a little outlined box, but it's not gonna have the text appear inside of it. And that all looks pretty good there. Um, I'm not actually doing any type of logic here. You'll see that it's taking whatever values passed in and it's not doing anything when it changes. All we're talking about here is the layout. We're not talking about how these fields work. So this is just nice and simple for now. So inside here, I'm gonna say edit text equals, oh, what did I do? It's got stanch field. And again, also these should be externalized. We shouldn't be having these explicitly hard-coded like this. And put in there. Something kind of like that. So this will give us a nice little form. And because I'm not passing any real data in there, I'm just gonna leave it like that. Then I'm just putting everything inside of a column. So if I come in here and just say, give me a column form, let's see what this ends up looking like. The first build is taking a little bit. And there we go. So now we have a single column that has all of our stuff. The label, the field, the label, the field, the label, the field, and so on. Now, depending on how your screen's laid out, this may work perfectly well. Um, and we're probably gonna want to, in this particular case, add in modifier equals Vertical scroll, remember scroll state, something kind of like that, which will allow our, our form to scroll some more. So uh, let's put a couple extra fields in here just to see what might be a thing here. I'll give a nickname. I used to have some, some friends in second grade down the street who called me Scooter after Scooter on the Muppet Show. And let's say, favorite dance, swing dancing, and maybe favorite game, Discs of Tron, which I just happened to have had the world record on back in 1984. Um, and at this point, I'm third in the world on the arcade game and second on the uh, arcade one-up game that I have sitting in the, the hallway. Uh, so that's my jam. Uh, so let's see how that looks now when I update it.
And now we have a scrollable form, which is really what I wanted to do is force it to scroll. So that's kind of interesting, um, but we're not really taking advantage of screen real estate if we rotate the screen. So if I do this, well, I have to set it up so that the screen rotation is going to happen. On this device, I'm going to swipe down. Whoops. And I'm going to swipe down one more time so I get more of these quick, uh, quick settings. And down here, you see we have auto rotate is turned off. I'm going to click it to turn it on. And then now if I rotate the device, we'll see that it actually rotates. And I'm really not taking advantage of screen space here. Uh, I could if I put the name and the field next to each other. But we have to know, you know, do we have enough room for that? Is there enough room to actually put stuff on the screen? So let's go ahead and rig up uh, an alternate layout that will work in this one. And then we'll try to figure out if we can actually make it automate between the two. So let me just flip him back around there. And now what I want to do, this is, a, I'm going to call this a, um, well, that's the, the column form. We'll just leave them called column form. And let's change this one to be a rows in column form. So this is going to give us a side-by-side -side approach here where each of these pairs, label and, and edit field, are going to be inside of a row. So I can just come in here and say row. I think that's it there. And then we'll put some close curlies in here. And then I can just come through here and just do control I all the way down to indent them appropriately. And there we go. And so now if I switch this to be rows in column form up here, let's see what that looks like. There we go. Now that's not super pretty, but it's a start. And if I rotate it, you notice in this form here, it might not be great because as we start to get longer labels, it's harder to have enough room over here to edit. But if I rotate, now I'm actually using the screen's real estate a little bit better here. And you notice I can still scroll, but whoops, but I don't need to scroll as much. That's the big advantage here. But boy, this is ugly. I mean, look at how everything is kind of jagged here. So I'm not super keen on that. And let's rotate that back. So let's tweak it a little bit. Instead of being rows and columns, let's try columns inside of a row. So we'll have one row that has a column of labels and then a column of fields. And let's see how that looks. So we had this one here. Actually, let's make a copy of this guy. And this is going to be columns in row form. So on the outside, we're going to start with a row. And he's going to be scrollable so that we can see everything if we need to. And then inside that, I'm going to define columns for each one of these guys. Whoops, a little too much there. And I think I just delete that. And let's see how that's gonna look when I do control I on all those. And I missed something somewhere. Oh, I see. And boy, I did not do that one very well. Okay, I think that's pretty good. So we have uh, individual um, column. Oh, I'm sorry, I did the wrong thing here. We really want just two columns. So we have one column that has all the labels, one column that has all the edits. That's what I was wanting to do here.
I'll put those labels up there. And then the second one, just going to have the single column. That's what I wanted there. So we have a, a column that just has the labels and then a column that just has the, the edit text. Let's see how that looks. Oops, I didn't change which one we were using up here. Okay, now there's some characteristics here that are a little bit better. We'll notice how all of these text fields line up because they're all in a single column. But we have a little bit of a problem with how these guys, they don't match up, they don't line up. And the reason for that is that when I have a column of labels, it just says label, 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 label. It doesn't care about anything happening over here. It just cares about inside this column, label, label, label. And over here inside this column, edit, 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 edit. And unless these happen to be the exact same size, they're not gonna line up. Now I can try to force it so things are the same size, but the problem there is then you're making assumption about how much space each of these guys need, which really isn't a good way to do this. Um, so this approach here, while it gave us that lineup, which was nice, it still failed us. We didn't have the ability to, uh, to have the things line up in both directions. So here we have this, hor this horizontal lineup, but we don't have vertical lineup. And in the other approach, we had a uh, vertical lineup, but no horizontal lineup. And so that, that's something that we need to try to think of. You know, we need to have a better layout manager to deal with that. So there are some built-in layout managers that can help this. Um, the uh, constraint layout is one of them. And he tends to be a little on the complex side. So do I really want to? Um, I'm going to actually just copy this one over because this one's a little long and it's not really the one that I'm going to prefer. But let's copy him over. And to bring this guy in as well. And let's see if I can do some imports here. Um, oh, I need to bring in a new dependency. Uh, where are you? Oh, the example I'm looking at is from my previous terms online class and the way that I organize things. It's a little different. I was trying to use a, a common catalog for everything. So I just got to find where that catalog is. And modules and the Tommel guy. So in previous terms, I used a, a version catalog like this that I could then bring into the build script. Uh, and it's nice for being able to keep everything consistent um, but it gives you one more layer of, of separation. Uh, it can make it a little harder to see. So inside here, I'm going to take a look for constraint. And we'll see down here, here's the dependency for the constraint layout. And there we go. So let me bring him in. And that's the top level. Let's go to the application module and add in a dependency for him. And whoops, didn't bring the quotes over. And we will clean him up, clean him up. And oh, actually I forgot when I did this example to change my compose version and change my Kotlin version. There we go. And I think that's gonna make that all nice and happy once I rebuild or re resync. There we go. And there we go. So now he's happy. And then back in here, I should be able to import these guys. And then I will talk about what all this means. 
And let's see here. I have a couple of functions I need to also pull over. So I have constrained edit. I didn't bring over constrained label. And there's the issue. Just need to pull him in. And most of this should be in pretty good shape now. OK. Whew. So constraint layout. The idea is that you have a bunch of components managed by a single layout manager. And he's going to look at the constraints that we're setting up between each of them and how we're actually trying to define them. So it'll actually, you know, will it look nice or something like that? Um, but as you can see, just to do what we're doing here, it's a good bit of code. Let's take a look at what the constrained edit and the constrained label does. These guys are extension functions on the constraint layout scope. Whenever we say we're using a constraint layout, inside of this, you'll see that he brings in a constraint layout scope, which gives you some functions you can call to be able to use constraint layout as well as some extensions on the modifier. So inside of here, I'm saying I'm going to create a constrained label, and I'm going to give him a reference ID. And this reference ID is what I'm going to use to create the constraints between different components to say if one is before another, one is on top of another, below another, and so on. Uh, and so by having that ID, we're setting it up so it's going to be uh, 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 easier to set their constraints up. Um, so I'm passing him in. I'm passing in the block of constraint setup, which will look kind of like this, meaning when I have this edit field, the start of the edit field is going to link to something else. And in this case, I have a barrier that is going to be used as kind of a little invisible line between the labels and the actual fields. And then this one says the end of me, so that's the uh, basically the right edge, is going to link to the right edge of my parent, which is the layout. So this just says that I stretch to the end edge or the right edge. Um, there's other ones up in here, which are like in between things. So, well, these, these guys here, you know, we're, we're linking to the barrier and then linking to the end. Uh, let's see, is there anything else interesting in here? Oh. Oh, I was trying to figure out what's making them vertically constrained. Because when I look at these, I just see the start and the end. So this is horizontal constrainment. I'm starting him at the barrier. I'm ending him at the end of the window. But I wasn't seeing any vertical things. And I forgot that I was using this vertical chain here. So this vertical chain is a function inside the constraint, the constraint scope that says, link all of these together vertically, starting at the top, the next one, 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 and so on. and I'm going to spread them out evenly. And then this guy, same kind of thing for the edits and spread them out evenly. In order for that to work, I have to define a bunch of references. So we have this create refs function here, who is going to create a whole bunch of those layout reference IDs, constraint layout reference IDs, and assign them to each of these. So this is a destructuring declaration. Create refs is going to create an object that has a whole bunch of functions called uh, um, component one, component two, component three, component four, and so on. And because he sets that up, I can just assign each of these ones. This guy gets assigned to component one, he's assigned to component two, he's assigned to component three, and so on. So this is kind of that advantage of using a uh, these component functions in Kotlin. You can have a function that basically returns a whole bunch of objects. Uh, it, it basically, he returns an object that collects a bunch of things. And each of those multiple values, you can just expand over here. So I create all those references. I'm going to set up the vertical chains. I'm going to set up the explicit uh, start and end chains. The barrier itself is going to be at the end of all the labels. And when we're talking start and end, we're talking about left to right or right to left layouts. It really doesn't matter which one we're using because behind the scenes, the user could switch over to a language that's a right to left language and it would automatically respect the start and end here and basically reverse everything for us. 
Um, you never want to say create left barrier or right barrier. I don't even know if they have those available here. Uh, using the constraint layout in the old view scheme, you did have left and right, and you never want to use those. You always want to use start and end, and then that will respect left to right or right to left languages for you automatically. Um, and it's pretty cool when that actually works. Um, so you can see there's a whole lot of things happening here. It's not super, super complex how to do it, but it's just a lot to write to make this to work. And for about this same amount of code that I'm writing here, I could actually write a common layout that's a custom layout that'll do a lot of this stuff for me automatically. But let's see how this one looks just to, to see here. Um, and I don't know if this has, it doesn't have nickname and such in there. It just has the basic stuff I had before. Uh, let's grab him and come up to the top. And whoops. Try running with him just so you can kind of see how this looks. And it works. It's just super complex for the user of this layout to do the job. And that's because it's so generic. It gives you a lot of flexibility to deal with a lot of components at once. And poof. There we go. So we see that he actually ended up spreading out space above and below. There's some different ways we can tweak this so that things will work out, but things you know, they are not quite lining up right there. I got to tweak a couple things in this example, uh, but it's it's getting a lot closer. And you see that it, you know with a couple of tweaks, we could actually get this to do the right thing. And, uh, and then of course, shift it up to the top. So this gives us a nicer looking form, but it was a lot of work to get there. I prefer in a case like this to just go ahead and create my own layout because then I have full control over it and I can have the exact same setup propagate to other places. But when you do that and you create the, the custom layout like that, it's really going to be a lot more special purpose. This constraint layout is really general purpose. You can use it for just about anything, which means you have to throw a lot of more configuration at it. But I would like to have something just says, hey, label tech, label edit, label edit, label edit, label edit, and be done with it. So let's take a look at how we can do that. I'm going to come up in here. Let's create a new file for this one. New file. And we'll call it form layout. Let's call it better form layout. And let's see what we can do about this guy. And I'm going to walk through this. I may copy a couple little blobs of code over, over from it. Uh, but I'm going to try to walk through it kind of in an order of the way I'd think about developing it. So we'll say composable. I'm going to say fun, better form layout. And then inside of here, I'm going to create my layout. But let's see what we need to pass in here. Um, well, I'm going to hold off on those for the moment. Um, the, the main thing that we need whenever we're defining our own layout is the stuff that we want to lay out. So that's going to be a composable function that just gives us the items that we need to lay out. And those items may have some modifiers on them to help us, or it could be strictly positional. For this layout, everything is strictly positional. So I'm gonna start by saying, give me some content, which is defined in a composable, just like that. So it'll add some stuff to the tree. And once we're done with that, we can actually assign and position things. So the first thing I wanna do is define a layout inside of here. So I'm going to say layout and the content is the content. How's that for nice and easy? And I'm going to make this thing vertically scroll. So let's say modifier equals scroll vertically. Wait a minute. Why is it not coming up there? So vertical scroll. There he is. Sometimes that works and, and pulls in the word modifier for us. Sometimes it doesn't. So here's our basic layout set saying, here's the components that we want to do. And there's really two phases to making this work. There's a measuring phase and a layout phase. 
And in the measuring phase, we actually will change the size of things and you know figure out how big things are going to be. Yeah, actually, in the measure phase, we're just figuring out how, how big things are going to be, how big we want them to be. Then we're going to place them. We're going to position them someplace on the screen. So inside here, one thing that I want to do is this is kind of open-ended. Oops. I want to make sure that labels and fields always match up, which means that it should be a multiple of two. So you might want to put a little constraint in here. And I can say something like check. And oops, actually, let's pass in the, the arguments. The arguments that come into this Lambda here are going to be measurables. and constraints. And uh, what we're gonna do here is measurables are the items that got expanded here. So these items here, the things that are gonna get added to the tree, those are considered the things that we're going to measure. They're called measurables. So I'm gonna just check here to say measurables.size mod two equals zero. And as long as that's true, I'm happy. But if it's not true, I want to say better form layout requires an even number of composables. Something kind of like that. And what is he unhappy about there? Oh, because I'm not I'm not finishing it up. Let me actually write the stuff at the bottom on this. Layout, Loop. and we'll fill in the details later. But the first stuff, everything up to this layout call is the measurement phase. So it's we're just going to figure out how big things are. Then inside of here, we're going to get passed in something to place. And so we can place those inside. Uh, well, we're going to create the placeable list ourselves. But this is where we're actually going to put them in certain place. So before layout, that is the measuring. Inside this layout, that's the placing. So the first thing we're just checking here is, do we have enough? And the way this check function works is he takes this expression, and if it's true, we're done, we don't do anything else. If he's false, he takes this lambda and generates an illegal argument exception out of it. So he will take this string that we're, we're creating inside the lambda and then create an exception based on it. So this is nice because if the string needed some kind of expensive build happening, or if you need to do something that's gonna be a little expensive, you're only gonna do that if the check fails. If we actually pass this string in as an argument, then you'd have to build the string every single time. So now how do we measure these guys? Um, we have two different types of, of items we're gonna deal with here. We have labels and we have um, uh, uh, edit fields. And measuring them is gonna depend on which ones are which and the type of layout that we're gonna do. So what I'd like to do is set this layout out so he's a little bit smart. I'd like to set him up so that he's going to say, if I have enough room, put the labels side by side to the actual text fields. If I don't have enough room, let's just put them in a vertical layout. So this will be an adaptive layout. Now, in order to do that, I need to know, first of all, what size is really the minimum I consider OK for uh, displaying things side by side. And then I need to know how much space I have to work with. So let's take a look at parameters coming in here. I'm gonna to need to pass in something up here to tell me what's the minimum size. So let me call it min width for side by side. And I'm gonna pass this in using density independent pixels. So I'm gonna say DP. And that's gonna be passed in as density independent pixels. Then I'm gonna take a look at these constraints to see how much space I have. Now constraints specify things in pixels. So it's already resolved things down to the pixels level. 
So down here, I'm going to say if constraints dot max width is greater than or equal to that min width side by side, then I'm going to do something else. I'm going to do something else. Now, this doesn't work so far because this guy is specified as ints for the min width, and this guy is in DP. So I have to convert the DP into that max width there. To do that, I need to take a look at the density of the screen and convert it appropriately. I can do that by saying width local density dot current. And that's going to pass in a density object as this. Once I have that, I can say the min width for side by side in pixels is equal to the min width in side by side DP to pixels. The density defines this two pixels function and gives us the appropriate conversion based on the screen density. So now I can use this instead of the DP one. But of course, I'm going to have to nest this appropriately. So let's take all this stuff that I defined. We'll move it inside there. And now we're in much better shape. So this layout will say, if I have enough room, do something else, do something else. So it gives me two different ways that I can set these guys up. And did I actually define that in this example? Yeah, I did. Good. OK, so inside of here, I need to do my measurement appropriately. To do that, I need to split up which things are labels, which things are controls. I only have this one list of measurables here. Now I'm going to assume that the first thing is a label, the next is a control. First thing is a label, next thing is control. And by control, I mean it's a text field, or maybe it's a switch, maybe it's a drop down list, could be any number of things like that. So let's split that up. So labels equals measurables dot filter. And actually, let's do a filter indexed because then we'll know which index it's at. And the index is going to be n. And then we're going to have a measurable. Whoops. And then inside here, I'm going to filter it if n mod 2 is 0, meaning it's an even number. So if it's the first item, third item, fifth item, and so on, keeping in mind everything's based at 0. I'm just going to kind of shrink that up a little bit. And then we'll do kind of something similar for controls. And we'll say if it's equal to 1. So that will split our list based on the um, filter index there. And I believe we could also use partitioned for that instead of filter index. Is there a partitioned index? Let me just try real quick here. No, there's not a partition indexed. So uh, I really have to do it this way as two separate calls. Partition is a nice function where you can pass in uh, basically a, a, a mapping function that'll tell you which bucket something should go into. And then it returns a couple different buckets. <coughs> now notice in these lambdas that this measurable isn't used. And I'm getting a little warning here. If I float over that warning, it says parameter measurables never used could be renamed to underscore. Whenever you have these parameters being passed in Kotlin, you can use an underscore to say, hey, there's a parameter coming in. I'm not going to use it. And so you're being really explicit here. And then the lint check won't tell you, oops, you didn't use this. You're explicitly telling things, I don't need it. And in this case, we don't even care which thing it is because we're not looking at his properties. We're only looking at his positions here. So now let's take a look at setting up some kind of little constraint on each of these labels. And what I mean by that is basically think of it as kind of a, a maximum box size that something can fit into. And you're gonna have a maximum and minimum sizes on it. <clears throat> and then we can use that to measure each of these things and say, hey, give me a best fit for this box based on some constraints that I have. So let's set up those constraints. Label constraints equals constraints 
And I'm going to say, give me a min width of zero and a min height of zero. So worst case, it just doesn't show up at all. Now you might want to put some minimum on there, but let's just start for arguments here, just say, we're going to say it can be as small as nothing. And then I'm going to say, give me a max width. And what I need to do here is come up with some idea of what's the biggest size I want a label to appear as. And I could just hard code it in here saying 40.dp, for example, 40.dp to px, let's say. And that'll give me the, the right number of pixels for 40dp. Um, and then I need to convert it to an integer because it's an integer there. Um, but instead of hard coding it, let's go ahead and let that be passed in. Maybe the for different forms, you want actually different sizes on it. So let's pass in here a max label width. And I'll say dp, which is going to be dp. And then I'll convert it the same way here. Max label width px. Let's convert him. And now I can use this guy and just convert him to an integer. And that should be good there. Uh, now, if we don't need this as a float anywhere else, we could just convert it to an int up front and never have to do it. But I'm pretty sure I need that as a float a little bit later on. Okay, now, how tall can this thing be? Well, how about infinity? How about we don't constrain that? This thing can be as tall as it wants to be. And because this section is scrollable, it'll go ahead and handle that. It'll expand to it. Um, if you want, you could put a, some other constraint on that. But here, I'm just going to say, hey, if somebody wants something a little bit bigger, that's fine. Let's not artificially constrain it. So this gives us our little box to, to measure things against. And now I can say label placeables equals label, uh, let me actually rename labels to be labels, label measurables. And uh, whoops, I never know how to spell that word. I'll do the same thing here for controls. Cause it's not a new, it's not a real word either way. So does it have the E, does it not have the E? Hmm, who knows? Uh, so we're gonna say, take those measurables that we have. So the ones that we split out of all the ones we're dealing with. And then I'm going to create some placeables out of them by measuring them. So I'll say it.measure label constraints. So this measure function inside of measurable figures out how to fit it based on these constraints. So it's gonna to try to do as good a fit as it can. You know, Maybe this measurable has a completely fixed size that happens to fit within these constraints, then we'll get that fixed size. If it doesn't fit in the constraints, it's gonna be chopped. So now we have our label placeables. Let's figure out how big we can have our controls. And that's all gonna depend on how big the labels are. So let's say val labels width equals label placeables dot max of it dot width. Poof. So this is gonna walk through all those label placeables and find the longest one and use that to drive where we're gonna place and how we're gonna size the controls next to them. And then we'll do something similar for the controls width. We'll just kind of figure out how big they can actually be. I'm gonna say, take my max width and subtract the labels width to figure out how wide these controls can be. And then we're gonna measure the actual controls. And we're gonna do it very similar to what we did up here. I come down, bring him and define this as controls constraints. And the main difference here is just gonna be that the width is gonna be fixed. So we're gonna say controls width for both of these. 
So we're telling it when we measure it, no matter how big the control wants to be, it doesn't matter. It's always going to have this fixed width, which is whatever the rest of the space is to the, to the right of the labels. And now let's measure these. Take this guy. La, 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 la. I'm going to say control. Okay, so the code's a little bit longer than it was for that one, but not that much. And we're making something more reusable. And we're going to say control measurables. Control constraints. Um, let's actually get rid of that S. There, that's better. So this will figure out how big each of those can be within those constraints. And then now we can say, how big do we have to be overall? So our overall height of this layout is going to be the max of either the height of all the, the labels or the max of the height of all the controls. So we're going to say label placeables, sum of it dot height and control placeables. Just kind of like that. And poof, we've now done all of our measurement here. And what is he not happy about? I think it's because, yeah, I imported the wrong max. Let me go up to the top here. I'm going to get rid of that max there because I did the max that actually is part of DP. I didn't import one that was part of ints. I probably could have just gone ahead and imported as well. Oh, what just happened? Did I import the wrong one again? Yep, I did. And let's come back down here and do that again. Instead of importing the DP one, I'm going to import the one that does for int or for float or whatever, all those use the same uh, function name. There we go. So that's much happier. So now we're going to do that layout. Now the layout's going to be a little different for each of these branches. So I'm actually going to make a copy in either spot here to place the items. And the one down here is going to be a lot simpler. But now let's figure out how we're going to place these guys. And what we're going to have to do is kind of just walk downward as we place these, keeping track of the Y position. Now keep in mind with uh, most graphic systems, Y equals zero is the top of the screen. X equals zero is the left edge of the screen. So we're going to start up at the top. And we're going to walk down, adding the appropriate height for each one of these. So let's do a label placeables for each indexed. And the reason we want to use for each index is because we're going to want to say for the first label, deal with the first control. For the second label, deal with the second control. And so we need to know which one is which there. And let's call this label. And then inside here, let's grab the control. So control placeables, sub index. And then let's actually figure out how big this stuff has to be and where it has to be. And in interest of time here, I'm just going to go ahead and copy this. And I'll just talk to it. So the first thing we want to figure out is how tall should this row be that we're defining, which is going to have a label next to a text field or some other control. And that's going to be driven by who's bigger. So I'm just going to use a max on that and say the row height is that. Um, and let's see. The Y offset is going to be how far from here I'm starting the top of each control. And that's going to depend on who's bigger and how much space is left over. So if the bigger one was the label, then row height minus label height is going to be zero. So it's going to be no offset for the label. If the bigger height was the control, row height minus control height is going to be zero. And so there won't be any offset there. Whichever the other one is, he's going to say, okay, Maybe I'm smaller. If I'm smaller, take that amount of space and divide it by two, and that'll line them up nice vertically. So these two figure out those offsets. And then let's just place them. So we're going to place it at zero, and then Y plus the label offset, and place this one at 
labels width. So he's going to be moved over. So he's in that next column, just like that. And like that, we have a layout that can do side by side very nicely. One thing that I missed here is when I'm when I'm defining this layout, I need to pass in the actual size we need. So we're going to say constraints dot max width and the height that we computed. And then one other thing I need to do is you notice how this is flagging it saying, oh, hey, you know, it's never modified. You can make it an eval. Forgot to modify it down here. So I can say y plus equals whatever the height of this row is. And then I move down to the next one. Now each control when we're measuring them takes into account padding and things like that by itself. So we don't have to actually go and look at the padding and put it in ourselves. We just assume the components are gonna do that for themselves. So this code in here defines the whole layout. And that's gonna be equivalent to what we tried to do in that constraint layout, which was a lot more complex. And actually I think the code there is, that's just a little bit more code than what we had for explicitly putting that out. And uh, specifying this is gonna be so much simpler. Now let's take a look at the other angle of this one, this other one down here, where we're gonna to have to try to figure out, okay, put in a label, then the next thing, a label control, label control, just in a single column. So what we're gonna do here, I'm just gonna go ahead and copy it. It's simpler, but it's kind of similar to what we did before. And I spelled measurables differently. Down here, I did it without the E. I can't make up my mind. I'm just gonna use the E, why not? So inside of here, we're gonna set up constraints for any component. The only constraint that we're doing here is saying it has to be exactly the full width. So min width and max width there. And then it can be as tall as it wants to be. And that's the same for every control because it's just a vertical list of them. So we're gonna take and say, all those measurables, measure them against those constraints and we'll call them placeables. And then my total height is just the sum of the heights. My layout, again, I'm gonna walk down by Y's, but now it's just place, 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 place because there's no lineup needed. And then boom, update the height. And so that's it for that guy. Now, if we're lucky, this layout will work. And let me find where I called this. And I'll just kind of paste that in. And let's do a, I called it a better form layout. Oops. And I call these a little different. So this is the DP and that one's DP. There we go. So now we can see that the specification of this is super, super simple. And if the screen's wide enough, it'll automatically convert to a different layout. Let's try using this and see what it comes up with. And if this looks okay, we can reuse this for other components, which will be super cool. And this is a little more complex subject on how to do layout, do user interfaces. But I, I think there's a lot of uh, real benefit to kind of learning that this exists. Because it's one of those things that it's in the documentation. I don't think it's deep enough, the details on how to, how to do it. Um, but it, it's something that people usually gloss over. And they usually think, well, I have to use columns. I have to use rows. I have to use constraint layout. And I would much rather code this than use a constraint layout. Um, at least in Compose. In, in the old view version of things, I think it was a little easier to do constraint layouts. Um, but I mean, it's, it's a super general purpose layout. If I have something that is a fairly reasonable layout like this that can be algorithmically computed, I'd much rather use that. And as we can see, boom, we have our scrolling layout. And I can tell this is the right one because it doesn't have my nickname in there anymore. Now, if I rotate this, look at what happened. We now have the side-by-side, -side, everything's lining up super nicely here. 
and it completely adjusted. Now, if I put a different kind of control in for something, like let's say that I uh, specified the number of lines for one of these. Let's see if I can get it to do that. So let's say for the street, let's make a slightly bigger edit here. I'll call it big edit. And then outline text field, what's the parameter? So you see how it says max lines and single lines? Well, let's set max lines. So max lines equals five. And let's throw a big edit in there somewhere for maybe the street. And we'll run that. And let's see what happens here when we actually start putting in some stuff. Whoops. Oh, that's right. It doesn't, uh, I'm not actually doing anything. I can't edit it. Uh, let's actually make this uh, longer. Something kind of like that. And there we go. And so now we'll see that it's taken into account that guy being bigger and lined up street appropriately with it. So this became kind of a nice general purpose layout here that we can use for creating you know, a simple side-by-side -side form. Or if you don't have enough room for side-by-side, -side, it automatically converts it into a, a, a single column that way. Um, and there's other ways you could do this. We don't have to have that automatic conversion be inside the better form layout itself. We could actually have this decision be made outside and then explicitly just use a column. And that would work just as well too. So I just wanted to show you how kind of like inside of a layout, you could make the layout a little bit smarter and the layout could make the choice for itself. But if you want it outside, hey, take it outside. That's perfectly fine. So any questions on that? Let's see, was there another one that I wanted to go over here? Uh, I think that was all of it with that layout. Okay, uh, so we're gonna take a quick break here. And after the break, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about slotted layouts, just so uh, you can kind of get the feel for what those are. I know we used them, but I wanna describe them a little bit better. Uh, and then I think time-wise, I'm probably gonna do the, uh, the fix up of the other part offline and then just uh, send a note about it. Okay, so let's take a look at how the, um, uh, how the slot APIs work that we talked about before. Now, a lot of common function stuff has been super, super easy to call here. You know, if we wanna have a screen that's for editing a person, if we wanna have some way of just grouping together what we're gonna put on a toolbar, if we wanna create a list of friends, all we gotta do is create a brand new function. And the new function calls other functions under the covers, passing whatever parameters we are to configure them. And that can make our life a lot easier to deal with things. We can come up with a common reusable way of doing things just by calling a function. But a lot of times, each of these ones have to repeat the exact same structure over and over and over again, just to change a few things. Like if we take a look in here, we have, this is a column of toolbar stuff and then label edit, label edit, and then a list of friends, then bottom bar stuff. If we take a look at that, we might have every single screen repeating the toolbar stuff and bottom bar stuff calls. Um, and maybe some other thing, maybe the friends list is on all the screens. Um, and that gets kind of wasteful. And it's also really tricky to make sure that they all get implemented the same way. So what we'll do, we, we wanna try to set up a function that can manage that structure and make sure things are in the right place. Make sure that common pieces that are always there are always there. Um, but then let you pass in the parts of the UE that actually changes. To do this, let's take a look at something called the template method design pattern. And the idea behind a template method is it's an algorithm with replaceable steps. You have some function that's gonna do some stuff, but a few parts of it are gonna change. 
So overall, you might have a general algorithm, but a couple parts change. You know, a good example of this is if you had a, a data structure, like a binary tree or a list or an array or something, and each of those objects had a for each function defined for it. And the for each function knows how to do the walking. It knows how to get from one item to the next. So if you're in a binary tree, how to traverse the tree either in order, pre-order, or post-order. If you're in a list, stepping through one item at a time, let's say if it's a linked list, you might say, go to the next, go to the next, go to the next, and so on. But there's still some stuff that you want to do at each node that's different. And so you can pass in the functionality that's going to be different. And we can really implement this in two basic ways. One way is polymorphic, which is where a superclass defines a function that has the, the replaceable steps. And then you subclass it in order to tweak the function. Um, if you do a strategy approach to it, instead of using superclasses and subclasses, you take each of those replaceable steps and make them a callback. You just pass a function in. So it becomes what's called a higher order function. Sorry, I think I'm going to sneeze here. Oh, I'm not. It's not happening. Oh, I thought it was going to. It was going to be a good one, too. Um, so inside, in the strategy approach, you're going to define a higher order function passing in uh, the steps that you want to replace with. So let's just get out of Android for the moment here and just think basic object-oriented programming and how this would uh, apply for a template method. Let's say that, for example, we had uh, a bunch of components that are going to be used inside a user interface outside of Android. We define a panel. We define a form layout without a border. We define a form layout with a border. We define a grid layout without a border and a grid layout with a border. Notice how there's you know, some common functionality there between those with those borders and things like that. What we could do is create a panel that has a few replaceable pieces. So this draw border is one of those replaceable pieces. And notice how I'm just defining it as not doing anything. You can override it to put a border in or not, but you don't have to. And then for the actual layout, the layout and how we determining where the children go, that's another function. In this case, we're just making it a straight old abstract so that it has to be defined in the subclasses. There's no reasonable default. For drawing a border, the reasonable default is don't do anything. And then to actually display things, we're going to draw the border and lay out the children. Boom. And then we give ways to actually add these children to the, the, the panel there to do things. And at a top level, that makes a pretty reasonable definition of this panel that we're trying to define. Now, don't think about this as being a, a, a Java AWT or a swing panel or anything like that. This is just a more generic example. And then create subclasses that figure out the combinations we're doing there. So maybe we have a form layout panel, which just defines the layout of how to do the children. And then we subclass it again to define drawing of the border. And we can do the same kind of thing on the grid side, define the, the layout, and then have a subclass of that to define the border. And so this makes it so that we can kind of factor things in a little bit more. It's not quite as flexible as it could be, though, because then if you come up with some other combination or some un other thing, like let's say instead of drawing a border, maybe you want to, um, I don't know, add support for making it clickable. Um, having that be passed in, that adds you one more uh, type of uh, uh, permutation that you have to create to these guys. So with a strategy, it makes things even a little bit simpler. We can define an interface for border and an interface for layout manager. And these are things that would define how do we draw a border? How do we lay out children? And then the panel just becomes something like this. And this is actually a lot closer to what Swing does, uh, where we're defining a border that you can set, which might be null, and we can define a layout manager you can set, which again might be null. And then to display it, we're just going to conditionally call those based on if they're true or not. So pretty simple guy there. And then to actually do stuff with it, we can define different types of borders, like a line border, different types of layout managers, like form layout and grid layout. And then the caller can now plug these pieces in. And in this particular case, we'll use the apply function in Kotlin, which if you remember, that's one of these scoping functions that is used for initialization. That's his main purpose. So we're going to create the panel, run this code against it, and then return that panel. So it gives you a way to do initialization in addition to creating the object.
So here I can use the line border in a form layout, line border in a grid layout. So I can mix and match things. That's really where the advantage of strategy comes in, is it gives you the ability to have the caller mix and match rather than you as the definer having to come up with all the possible combinations of things. So uh, let's see, this one. Oh, this one is in, instead of uh, doing them as uh, actual objects, actually classes here. So we see we have an object that has functions inside of it. In this particular one, we're gonna use lambdas um, or we could use you know references to functions. So here I'm defining border as being a function that takes no arguments and uh, does something. It doesn't return a value. And layout manager takes a list of components and does something with them. So here we're going to call border question mark dot invoke language manager question mark dot invoke. Um, you have to call invoke directly here because it's nullable. That's that's the reason why we're doing this. So this particular version, I can have some functions to do the work, and then directly use functional references. So in this particular example, border equals colon colon line border. Um, or if I wanted to, I could inline define them using lambdas. So here I'm saying panel apply, define the border function that's going to fill in the details, define the layout manager that's going to define the details. Uh, so this gives you a great deal of functionality. And this one I like better than the previous one, uh, just because you can actually just use lambdas. You don't have to have uh, actual objects being passed in, and you don't have to have an interface representing those. All you're doing is defining the functional type that you want and implementing that functional type either via a function or via Lambda. Now, another approach is instead of setting those properties, what if we had them be parameters to the function that you want to call? In which case, you know, we could even do this function without having a class definition around it. It can be a top level function. Anytime you pass a function to another function, the, this function display is called a higher order function. And a higher order function either takes functions as parameters or returns a function as a result, or both. It could do both as well. So in this case, again, we have the same kind of function definitions. But now when we call display, we end up putting in the, the references as parameters to display there. Um, now I'm not sure this is th this setup here where we're saying do the call display during initialization probably isn't really the right thing to do, but I'm just trying to give the idea of how you'd call these functions. So this leads to and compose the concept of a slot API. It's gonna take advantage of this same kind of functional parameters being passed in. So example, the scaffold, which is defined by compose, takes several slots, top bar, bottom bar, drawer content, content, floating action button. And then it positions them for you in this layout based on what's there and what's not there. Um, and then the drawer content can slide in and slide out. By doing this, you don't have to worry about the logic of figuring out where things go. Scaffold can consistently set the size of a top bar, the size of a bottom bar, the size and position of a floating action button, and the mechanics for how the drawer content opens and closes. You don't have to worry about the detail. You just worry about what goes in those slots. And what we're going to do in here is we're going to create a little example of a border layout. And this is a layout that was defined in, in Java AWT quite some time ago, uh, I guess in the 90s. And this gives you the ability to say what goes in the north part, south, east, west, and center. So if you had a layout which you could use two or more parts of these, you could define it this way fairly easily and not have to worry about how things get computed in which positions. So let's take a look at that example. And come down here. And let's see what we might do with, with a uh, border layout. And this one's gonna be a little simpler because we're not gonna have to do, you know, we could do the same layout thing where we compute everything by hand, but this particular one is actually pretty straightforward to do with rows and columns. So I can define this as a composable, give us a border layout, and he's gonna have inside of him a north, which is gonna be a composable function. And what I'm going to do is pass in a modifier. Is 
something kind of like that. And let's see, I wanted to make him be nullable. And, uh, oops, I need a body. That's what he's complaining about. There we go. So this is going to let me say north is null if you don't define it. That'll give me some chance in the logic below to say, is it there or not? I'm going to do the same thing with south, east, west, and center. It's kind of like that. And finally, I'll give ourselves a modifier that somebody else can pass in if they want. If they don't want to, I'll just pass in the base modifier, which doesn't do anything. It just doesn't have anything in there. Now, what I'm gonna do inside here logic-wise is figure out how much space and size each of these needs, and then just pass a modifier representing that so that they can use that modifier and poof, they'll be in the right spot. So down inside here, I'm gonna start with a column that's gonna have the north, the west, center, and east, and then the south inside of it. So we always start with this column at the top, and he's going to have the passed-in modifier as his modifier. And then inside there, if we have a north, put it there. So I'm going to say, if we have a north, we'll use the let scoping function to only do this lambda if north is not null. And then I'm just going to go ahead and put a little box inside there where we say modifier equals modifier dot fill max width. So he's going to fill the entire width of the screen. And then we'll just say wrap the content height. So we'll just be as tall as we need to be based on the content that's passed in. And inside there, we're going to say it passing in modifier fill max width. Boom, just like that. So this guy is going to say, hey, fill yourself all the way as far as the width there. And we're just putting a little box around it that we can just hold on to to keep track of that content height being wrapped. Now we're going to do the same thing for south at the bottom. That should be good. And then we need to do with this center section. And the center section is going to be a row with possibly three elements inside of it. So we're going to have a row. And he's going to need a whoops modifier in there. And we're going to start off by filling the max width again for the entire row with that west, center, and east section in it. We're going to give it a weight to take up all the remaining vertical space after north and south are laid out. Notice that north and south don't have weights. They're going to be filling up their content height, and that's it. This row is gonna have a weight. We could put any number in that we want. It just represents we're gonna take up all the remaining space. If there were two elements that had weights, they would split the remaining space after north and south were there. And let's see, so he looks good there. And then inside there, I can say, do I have a west? If so, then I'm gonna create a little box again. Let me just go ahead and copy one of these. And he's going to fill max height of the row. And he's going to wrap the content width. So he's only going to be as wide as he wants to be. And then we're going to do the same kind of thing here, passing in the max height. And it's going to be the same for east on the other side. And now we have to deal with center. And inside there, let's put him up there. We're gonna say make him fill max height, but he's gonna have a weight within that row, which will make him take up all the rest of the space after west and or east have been uh, laid out. And then he's going to fill to the max size of whatever's left over. And I think that's really all we need. So he's a really nice, simple layout. We're just having a common structure for how we're managing north, south, east, west, and center. 
and then we can actually call it. And so let's take a look at an example run of this guy. So we'll create a composable. And inside there, I'm gonna say, give me a border layout. I'm gonna say modifier is, let's fill the max size I have available. And then, whoops, let's define our north, south, east, west, and all that. So I'm gonna say north is going to be just a text. And we will say, whoops, give me a north as the text there. And then the modifier is going to be the modifier passed into this Lambda, because remember the definition here, I pass a modifier in, which gives us the base constraints, it dot, and then maybe I give it a different background color. Maybe like a color dot blue or something like that. And then I can do the same thing for the other ones. And we'll define south. And you can define them in any order. Now let's make south. We'll have south be blue as well. West, center, and east. Kind of like that. And let's see what colors I want to go green for each of these, I guess. And then maybe red for the center. Something kind of like that. Well, let's put him in place. Where did the main, oh. Oh, I defined that in the wrong file. Oh, well, that's fine. We'll just come back up into here, use him. And let's run it. And it's not gonna be a particularly fantastic looking user interface here, but you can see how it's taking up the, the space that we want. And if we wanted to, we could add some padding around these guys. So like each of these, where did I find my sample? I guess I put it in here, right? We could go ahead and add to these. So make color blue and then maybe padding 8.dp. And let's go ahead and run that. And now we should see some padding around each of these little text, the, the labels inside there. And you can tweak it however you want to. Uh, so this gave us a pretty simple layout, but the point here is really just to think about how those slots work in this user interface and how we can uh, preserve the positioning, the caller not having to worry about how that positioning is computed. So these are a couple of tools you can use for various parts of your user interface. When you see the same kind of things happening multiple times when you're defining your functions, think about factoring them out into either a function that has calls to others underneath it or a slotted function like this that his whole goal is to be that template method. He's deciding how I want to structure the algorithm, but I'm leaving the, some gaps for people to fill in. Uh, and that can really make your user interfaces a lot more consistent rather than having every single function define every single piece that it needs uh, and have inconsistencies pop up because it's so easy to to change one function and forget to change all the other ones. Okay, any questions there? Well, that is all I have for tonight. So we will call it a night. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask on the discussion forums or uh, send me an email if you need to. And uh, again, if you put something on the discussion forums, please send me an email just to let me know you put something there. Uh, Cause it looks like the, the uh, notifications aren't quite working right. And I don't always remember to go and check the discussion forums. I need to, I probably should check those tonight just to make sure.